I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Joni, to whom I had been married for seven years, sitting on a table in the dining car with her friend Jim, who was having sex with her until she was half dead. I looked around, thinking that there must be an attendant or a waiter somewhere. But, strangely enough, he was not there. At that moment, all the love I had for my wife died. It was supposed to be a fun excursion for the two of us to reconnect. I was surprised when she told me that Jim, her friend from work, would be there. She insisted that he was a friend to both of us, but the truth was, I didn't care about the guy, and at the time I couldn't think of a single reason why he would want to come with us. But now I knew. I also knew that I would need evidence for my divorce. Oh yes, it was over between us. Sure, seeing them having sex on the table got me a little excited, but there was no way I was going to put up with that complete disrespect. I took out my cell phone and started recording their date on video. I had no desire to watch or hear what they had to say. They seemed to have each other on that table forever, and I couldn't believe how rude Jim was to her. She even seemed to like it. Maybe I should have been rude to her, but that just wasn't my style. Finally, they stopped, and Joni straightened her dress, giving Jim her panties. The new, sexy panties that I thought she had bought for me. We have to be careful, she said as they took their places. If George finds out about us, he won't be happy at all. Fuck that weakling, Jim said with a grin. We had sex all last year and he never found out. What? I thought to myself. This shit has been going on for a year? I knew Joni and I had a bit of a strained relationship due to my busy work schedule, but damn, that's what kept a roof over our heads. Of course, Joni also worked, but her salary, whatever it was, went to pay for the things she wanted, clothes, accessories, trips to the beauty salon, and so on. That was the whole idea of taking a few days off to do some rail travel, sightseeing, and time in each other's arms. So, Jim said, are you going to make him fuck you after me when you get back to him? That would be so vicious, wouldn't it? She asked. Did you do what I said about contraception? He asked. Joni nodded her head. Yes, she said. I stopped taking it so you could knock me up. I told George that I'm on my period this week, so he doesn't expect any sex. They both had a good laugh about it. So why are you staying with him? Asked Jim. Obviously you don't love him. Otherwise, you wouldn't do this to him. Well, it's not that I don't love him, she said. I like him enough, but I just don't have that burning love for him anymore. Besides, he brings a good salary, and you know that I could not live on what I earn. You stay with him for the money, he said. She nodded her head. Pretty much, she said. Damn it, I could never afford the comfort he got on this trip, and neither could you. When do you want to get together again? He asked. I don't know. Maybe later this evening after he goes to bed, she said. I saw and heard enough and finished recording the video. I returned to the sleeper car where Joni and I were staying and considered my options. Divorce was a given, but there had to be something more. Both she and her boyfriend had bills to pay. I took out my phone again and went to the contacts section, looking for my lawyer's number. Fred Jurgens, the man said, answering the phone. Fred, this is George. I need you to start preparing divorce papers for me, and I want you to use a prenuptial agreement, I said. Divorce? Fred asked in surprise. Are you sure about this? I've never been so sure of anything in my life, I said. On what basis? asked Fred. Adultery, I said. I have a video that I can send you if you need proof. Yes, do it, Fred said. I have a marriage contract here, so it won't take too much time. When do you want her documents served? The sooner the better, I said. We'll be back in Springfield in a couple of days, so maybe you can arrange for her paperwork to be served at the station. I also need to find out everything I can about her boyfriend, Jim Simpson. He works with her. I'll have our investigator look into it, Fred said. Send me a video and I'll watch it. Don't do anything stupid, okay? Yes, of course, I said. You know me. Yes, I know. Fred said. That's why I said, don't do anything stupid. Fred always made me laugh. We ended the conversation, and I sent Fred the video. Then I sat back and thought for a minute about what else I could do. 
I took out my tablet and connected my phone to it. After transferring the video to the tablet, I turned on the phone's hotspot and used it to connect my tablet to our home network through a VPN, or virtual private network. I set this up a while ago so I could access my files securely from anywhere in the world. The first thing I did was log into our banking system and do the typical dance, close joint cards, transfer funds, etc. I didn't want to take any risks. Even with the prenuptial agreement, I had another evil thought. Joni enjoyed using her home computer for her personal email. Luckily, she didn't know much about things like security, so I was able to log into her email account with a couple of clicks. I copied the video first to my tablet, then to my home computer. Opening her email client, I wrote an email trying to sound like her. I used a corny theme that sounded like hers. Check out my fun train ride. In the body, I wrote, Look what I do while my clueless hubby sleeps. I then attached the video to an email and sent it to everyone on her contact list. That's right. Friends, family, her work colleagues, everyone who can. I looked at it for a minute, then hit send. To hell with all this, I thought to myself. I opened the door to our compartment just in time to see one of the conductors. I motioned for him to come over when he looked up at me. Is everything all right, sir? He asked. Well, my wife says she wants to move to another compartment, I said. Could you tell me which compartment Jim Simpson is in? The conductor checked his tablet for a moment before answering. Do you want your wife's things to be moved to this compartment? He asked. Are you sure? It's not nearly as nice in economy class as it is here. That's life, I said. He nodded his head in understanding. I see, he said. Of course, I will help you pack her things. We worked quickly, not really caring how well her clothes were packed. Once we had finished, I helped the conductor carry her things to his compartment, which was half the size of ours. I laughed as I tossed her things onto his small bunk bed. Let her deal with this herself, I thought to myself. I'll need to make her a new key card, said the conductor. He took a white card from his pocket and inserted it into the magnetic recording device connected to his tablet. When he finished, he looked at me. Do you know where she is? he asked. I nodded my head. I know where she was the last time I saw her, I said. Lead on, he said. We walked through the entire train and entered the dining car. Johnny and Jim were still making eyes at each other when we approached them. I sat down in one of the chairs at the table and the clerk caught Joni's attention. Yes, she asked, looking worried. I need to give you your new key card, he said, and pick up the old one. She looked surprised. What do you have in mind? She asked. Obviously there was a mix-up in the allocation of seats, so I need to give you your new key, he said. This guy was cool as a cucumber, I thought. Angry, Joni pulled out her key card and handed it to the attendant. He smiled and handed her a new card. Thank you, he said. Have a nice trip. He turned and walked away. Johnny looked at me angrily. What the hell are you doing? She asked. I'm just making the game easier for you and Jim, I said. Her eyes widened. What do you mean? She asked. You think I don't know about you two? I asked. Joni started to get nervous. She looked at Jim, and he looked worried. He looked at her key card and noticed the compartment number. Wait, he said. This is the key to my compartment. I nodded my head. I thought that way you two wouldn't have to have sex on the dinner table, I said. I understand it might be a little crowded here, but that's the way it is. By the way, did Joni ever tell you about the prenup she signed when we got married? What are you talking about? Asked Jim. Well, if you're going to fuck someone's wife, you should know a little about her first. Do you agree? I asked. Look, it was all just for fun, he said. We didn't mean anything like that. Joni spoke. That's right, George, she said. It was all just for fun. This will not affect our marriage in the slightest. Really? I asked, taking out my tablet. I scrolled to the part where they were talking and pressed play. Listen to this, I said. I like him enough, but I just don't have that burning love for him anymore. 
Besides, it pays well, and you know I couldn't live on what I make, Joni's voice said in the video. So you stay with him for the money, Jim said in the video. She nodded her head. I stopped the video and looked at her. So, bitch, I said, I'm just a walking salary for you. Darling, she began. I stopped her. You can never call me honey, honey, honey or anything else, bitch, I said. I don't think you should even call me by name. I think you should call me Mr. Duvalier, and since you don't consider yourself my wife, I'll take this, I added, taking off her wedding ring. And I'll take this, I added, grabbing her purse and taking the house key out of the large key ring she kept there. I took off my wedding ring and placed it in front of Jim. You can take this. I don't need this anymore. I turned to Jim. The prenuptial agreement she signed, Jim, states that in the event of adultery, the guilty party, in this case Joni, gets absolutely nothing. I will leave her her clothes and jewelry. But that's all. I don't think she can keep paying for her car. Luckily, I put the paperwork in her name so it will take a hit to her credit rating. You fucking bastard, he said, starting to stand up. I grabbed the fork and tried to stab him in the arm. He sat down again. Don't joke with me, idiot, I said. Please, Joni said, tears welling up in her eyes. Jay, I mean, Mr. Duvalier, please don't do this. I've learned my lesson. Can't you forgive me so we can put this behind us? No, bitch, I said, rewinding the video to the point where they started talking about knocking Joni up. I played the video so they could both hear clearly. You two have been doing this shit to me for a year now, and you conspired to get pregnant from Jim and marry the child off as mine, I hissed, looking at Joni. Right now, I hate the hell out of you, and I pray to God that I never see you again. I looked at Jim before speaking again. You wanted a lying, cheating bitch, asshole? You got it, I said. Good luck. I think she won't get much support from her family and friends. What do you mean? asked Joni. I shrugged. Check your email, I said. She took out her phone and opened her mobile email app. Her eyes widened. What did you do? she asked. I just shared your impressions with your family and friends, I said. You looked like you were having such a great time. I just knew you would love to share this with others. You bastard, she hissed. My parents just disowned me and my sister says she never wants to see me again. My friends think I'm a worthless fallen woman and now they all hate me. Can you blame them? I asked calmly. I gave you the seven best years of my life. All this time I loved only you and never even thought about another woman. I worked my ass off for you. I bought that big house that you simply had to have. Bought you that new BMW. I never complained when you spent all your money on yourself and I never complained when you went off, supposedly, with the girls. And what did I get in return? You're tearing my heart out. You're cheating on me and ruining our marriage, so I don't blame them one bit. Please just give me one more chance, she begged. I shook my head. No, I said. You could have ended this at any time, but you chose not to. So this is the end of the road. You have chosen your bed, and now you will sleep in it. I hope it was all worth it for you. I think they'll give you the papers when we get to Springfield. Just sign the papers and we'll be done with it. Then you and Jim can fuck each other to death. I don't care. Jay, uh, Mr. Duvalier, she said. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? I'll do anything. I stood up and thought for a moment before answering. Yes, I said. There is one thing. Actually, two things. Her eyes lit up in anticipation. Eat shit and die. She fainted in tears when I turned and walked away. I fought back my tears as I returned to my compartment. After I closed and locked the door, my phone rang. These were her parents. Apparently they saw the video I sent them. George, what the hell is going on? Asked Cliff, Joni's father. Hi, Cliff, I said. I caught your daughter having sex with another man. I made a video and sent it to you. I am filing divorce papers based on a prenuptial agreement. I think she'll be served when the train gets to Springfield. I wanted you to know why I'm divorcing her. Is there any way to ignore this? He asked. I mean, divorce is so radical. No, Cliff, I said. If you listen to what your daughter and her lover said, you will understand that I cannot come to terms with her betrayal 
I'm just a salary to her, that's all. She even wanted me to raise a child with another man. This stupid girl, he said. I heard you renounced her, I said. No, he said. I asked her to give me at least one good reason not to renounce her. I am still waiting. Well, whatever it is, I'm glad you made us sign this prenuptial agreement, I said. It probably didn't happen the way you imagined, but you did me a great favor. I'm sorry, George, he said. You're right, and since then I've loved you like the son I never had. I think highly of you too, I said. Is there anything we can do? He asked. Actually, yes, I said. Do you still have that spare house key I gave you? Yes, we have it, he said. Could you call a truck and pick up her things from the house? I asked. I won't be in town for another couple of days and I don't want her in the house. I'll reimburse you for the cost of the truck. Of course we can do it, he said. What about her car? You can take that too, but I'm not sure how long she'll be able to use it, I said. Maybe you can teach her how to budget, or maybe she can trade it for something she can afford. Okay, he said. Look, George, I'm really sorry about all this. It's not your fault, I said. We said goodbye and ended the conversation. The phone rang the second I put it in my pocket. It was Joni's cousin, Lisa. I answered the call. What do you want, Lisa? I asked. So, have you finally found out about Joni? She asked. Yes, I said. I take it you're going to divorce this worthless bitch? She asked. Of course, I said. I have already taken some steps. Okay, she said. You know, I've always been partial to you. To tell the truth, I also found Lisa damn attractive. But I was married to her cousin, so that made her unavailable. Well, you're pretty sexy yourself, I said. Lisa had a habit of wearing short skirts and tiny ripped shorts around me, and it always delighted me. So you noticed, she said. Of course, I told her. Now that you kicked that bitch out, do you think we can hook up? She asked. Maybe when the divorce is final, I said. Okay, I understand, she said. I've been waiting for you for seven years, so I think I can wait a few more months. See you when you get back. The call has ended. In the end, something good can come out of all this. The next two days went by pretty quickly for me. I spent most of my time talking on the phone. I rarely left my compartment without coming face to face with these two traitors. I heard from Fred, who told me what I suspected. Jim Simpson was a notorious womanizer who was divorced twice due to infidelity. His last wife also brought allegations of domestic violence against him. I assumed Joni would gravitate towards someone like that, but I hoped she would wake up in time and leave him. Just before the train arrived in Springfield, Joni knocked on my door. Who is this? I asked through the closed door. It's me, Joni, she said. What do you want? I asked. I want my husband to come back, she screamed. Cool shit, bitch, I said. I want a faithful wife who would love me, but I didn't get that, did I? Please, Jay. Uh, Mr. Duvalier, I made a mistake, she exclaimed. You've gone way beyond a mistake, bitch, I said. Get out of here before I call security. You must be in economy class. Please, she begged. Can't we just talk? No, I said. Leave. I never want to see you again. I heard her sniff as she left. Part of me felt bad for her, but I didn't really care. She brought all this upon herself with her lies, betrayal, and disrespect. I got off the train and looked around to see if I could see her and Jim. I saw them get off the train a few cars away. Neither of them looked too happy. Cool shit, I thought to myself. As I watched, a man approached Joni and handed her a manila envelope. She opened it and immediately burst into tears. I smiled and walked away. I got into my car and drove home. I noticed that Joni's car was missing and all of her belongings had been removed, including several pieces of furniture that she had when we first got married. I put my things away and walked around the house, taking down all the pictures that showed her. I wanted nothing to remind me of this cheating bitch. A couple of hours later, I heard a knock on the door. I looked out the window and saw Lisa. God, she looked sexy in those shorts. I opened the door and let her inside. She was carrying a large dish of something that smelled like lasagna. 
She walked in as if she owned the house and placed the dish on the kitchen table. When she turned to me again, I looked her up and down. She was wearing a short T-shirt that reached just below her chest. Her shorts were shorter than I remembered, and there was just a tiny piece of fabric showing between her legs. I wanted to make sure you had something tasty, she said. I don't want you to get hungry. Thank you, Lisa, I said. I appreciate it. Her eyes sparkled as she smiled. Would you like to stay and have dinner with me? I would love to, she said. Go wash yourself, and I know where everything is. I headed upstairs and quickly washed my face before returning. By the time I returned, the table was already set, and Lisa even poured each of us a glass of wine. I pulled out a chair for her and admired her slender hips as she sat down. She grabbed my plate and put a nice piece of lasagna on it, which had a lot of meat and layers of cheese. I thought it took a lot of work on her part. After she helped herself to a small portion, I looked at her. Looks delicious, I said. Thank you, she said in response. I love to cook, especially for those who are truly dear to me. Indeed, the lasagna was as delicious as it looked, and I ate every bite, even cleaning the plate with a piece of the garlic bread she had baked. You must be hungry, she said. There's no way I'm going to waste such delicious food, I said. It was the best lasagna I've ever tasted. She smiled, coming close to me. I'm glad you liked it, she said, sitting down on my lap. There's a lot more where that came from. And maybe someday I'll even bring you dessert, she added, lifting her t-shirt to show off her beautiful size two breasts. I felt a familiar stirring in my pants as she gave me a hot kiss. I need to go home and feed my cat, but I'll be there tomorrow. I can't wait, I said. She smiled as she stood up. This is just a preview of what I have in store for you, she said. I guess I'll just have to let little George take care of me until your divorce is final. Little George, I asked. That's what I call my vibrator, she said. I see, I said. Well, let's hope Joni doesn't contest the divorce. We kissed a little before Lisa left. Fortunately, Joni did not resist the divorce. Obviously, she realized that I had confused her and decided to end the marriage. She and Jim managed to keep their jobs, but from what I heard, they found it difficult. She signed the papers and called me to apologize and say it was done. Fred called to let me know that the signed papers had been submitted and that in 30 days I would be a free man. Was I happy? I was glad to be rid of my cheating wife, but part of me felt like something was missing. For many years I loved only this woman and hoped to retire with her, surrounded by children and grandchildren. But this was not destined to happen. I was also upset that I never got my revenge on Jim. I thought about filing for alienation of affection, but Fred said it was a waste of time. I thought about beating him to a pulp, but decided against it, because I had no desire to go to jail. Lisa came over every evening with something she had cooked, and we shared dinner. She even made a note on my calendar, counting down the days until the divorce became final. She was a tireless teaser and even gave me a couple of DVDs filled with her selfies and home videos of Little George. Pretty soon the 30 days were up and I received papers saying the divorce was final. I was surprised that I didn't hear anything from Joni because I figured she should have called or done something stupid by now, but she didn't. Well, Lisa didn't wait for my call. She came that day and knocked on the door. This seemed strange to me because I had already given her the key to the house and told her that she could come over any time. I opened the door and experienced the greatest shock of my life. There she was on the front porch. She stood completely naked and her bare feet were spread quite wide. I took her inside and kissed her deeply, running my hands over her smooth skin. She kissed me back just as hard, all the while tearing my clothes off. As a result, we ended up naked on the sofa, and before I knew it, she took hold of my manhood. I have never experienced greater bliss in my life. I've reached the finish line. Fuck me, baby, she moaned. Now I'm your woman. Take me. Who am I to complain? I did everything she asked, and we reached climax at the same time. This is so much better than I ever thought, she moaned. Never stop having sex with me, George.
do it to me. Please, baby, I love you so much. I love you too, I said, crushing her under me. We spent a few more rounds on the couch and finally went to the bedroom where we made love most of the night. As we held each other, I realized that I had to be with this woman for the rest of my life. She must have been thinking the same thing. She turned on her side and looked into my eyes. I've always loved you, George, she said. I will never do to you what my stupid cousin did. I want to spend the rest of my life right here with you. Does this mean that you will marry me? I asked. She smiled and hugged me. Yes, baby, she said. I will marry you and make you the happiest person on earth. We kissed and made love some more before falling asleep in each other's arms. A few days later, Joni's father called me. Lisa and I had just finished making love and were leaning back on the bed, watching a movie while sharing a bowl of popcorn. George, Joni is in the hospital, he said. I sat up, surprised. What's happened? I asked. That idiot she was with beat her to a pulp, he said. I told her to call the police, but she refused. Will she be okay? I asked. Eventually, but I don't think it will last long if she stays with him, he said. Okay, we'll go there and check on her, I said. We? Asked her father. Yes, Lisa and I, I said. Is Lisa there with you? He asked. Yes, I said. I couldn't have done it without her. Okay, he said. I understand. Meet me at the hospital. After we finished talking, I explained to Lisa what happened and told her what I had learned about Jim fucking Simpson. We were both angry at Joni for what she did, but neither of us wanted to hurt her physically. We cleaned ourselves up, got dressed, and headed to the hospital. After speaking with the nurse, we were taken to her room. She looked terrible. Her face was black and blue, and one eye was swollen and would not open. One arm was in a cast, and liquid was dripping from an IV into the other. She moaned weakly as we entered the room. I wanted to hug her and tell her everything would be okay, but I didn't. J. Mr. Duvalier, she said, and a tear rolled down her cheek. I raised my hand to stop her. You can call me George, I said. What's happened? Jim wanted to use my car to take his date on a date, and I told him no, she said slowly. He got angry and started beating me, calling me all sorts of names. I told him it was my car, and almost half of my paycheck was going towards payment, and there was no way I was going to let him use it to impress some slut. He didn't stop beating me until I threatened to call 911. That's when he ran away. I don't know where he is. I was having a really hard time breathing and my chest was hurting really bad, so I called 911 and they came and brought me here. Did you tell the cops what happened? Asked Lisa. No, she said. I was afraid to do it. I thought that if he went to prison, he would kill me when he got out. I shook my head at the crap I heard. Let me get this right, I said. You ran away to live with the guy you cheated on me with, and now he's cheating on you. This is true? She sobbed and nodded her head. Yes, she said. I really screwed up, didn't I? Yes, you did it, said Lisa. But you don't deserve it. He committed a crime and needs to be put behind bars. Johnny, I said. Did you know that he had a history of domestic violence? I knew he could be a little rough, but no, I didn't know that, she said. Lisa hugged her cousin and tried to comfort her. Joni noticed the diamond ring on her finger. Are you engaged? asked Joni. Lisa smiled and nodded her head. Yes, she said. George and I are going to get married. Joni began to sob, and her tears soaked Lisa's T-shirt. But you're still my cousin, and I still love you, even though I think you're a stupid bitch for what you did to George. Just then, Joni's parents entered the room. They were furious when Lisa and I told them what happened. Okay, Cliff said to Joni, we'll stay here with you and move you back to the house when you're discharged. You will stay with us until you can get back on your feet. He looked at me and motioned for me to go out into the corridor. What do you know about this guy, Simpson? He asked. I told him what I learned from Fred and he nodded his head, making mental notes. And you say he works with Joni? Yes, I said. He nodded his head again. Okay, I'll take care of Simpson, he said. 
I'm not going to discuss this with you. You don't need to know the details. Trust me. What's going on with you and Lisa? Well, she helped me get through my divorce and now we're engaged, I said. He smiled and nodded his head. I'm not surprised, he said. She was always partial to you. Congratulations. At least you'll still be part of the family. Thank you, I said. Is there anything I can do to help with Simpson? He shook his head. No, he said. I'll take care of everything. Besides, you're getting married soon, and the last thing Lisa needs is for her new husband to be in jail. The less you know, the better. Cliff was walking down the hallway, talking to someone on his cell phone. I headed back to Joni's room. Joni's mother looked at us. I'll stay with her overnight, she said. Cliff will make sure to take her things from this man's apartment. Thank you for stopping by. You're welcome, I said, hugging her. Joni looked at me with tears in her eyes. I'm so sorry, she said. For all, can you forgive me? I thought for a moment before speaking. I think so, I said, aware that the other two women were looking at me. In the end, we will still be a family. Thank you, she said. I walked over and hugged her goodbye. Get well, I said, lightly kissing her forehead. Take good care of him, Joni told Lisa. Please. Lisa smiled and nodded her head. I'm going to do it, she said. We left the hospital and headed home. I had no idea what Cliff meant about Jim, but I had heard stories about his time in the military. I also knew that he had friends in high and low circles, so I followed the local news, even looked at the obituaries. I didn't see anything there, but a week later, there was a small article in the local newspaper about a man being attacked and severely beaten outside a local bar. According to the story, a man named Jim Simpson was confronted by a group of men who ended up breaking three of his ribs, his jaw, his kneecap, and his arm. The story also said something to the effect that his manhood, below the waist, was seriously damaged. I couldn't help but laugh at this. Cliff took Joni's things from the apartment and moved her back to his house. Her parents hated what she did to me, but she was still their daughter, and they still loved her. Lisa and I got married a couple of months later. Because her parents had died in a car accident several years ago, Cliff walked her down the aisle and shook my hand. Joni came with her parents and cried when the preacher declared us man and wife. We had a great honeymoon in Las Vegas. When we returned, we moved her things into the house. She decided that since I made more than enough for the two of us, she would quit her job. Now I have a new job, she told me. What is this? I asked. To make you happy, she said with a sly smile. And she did it. And then, one day, a few months later, she attacked me with words that every husband fears. We need to talk, she said, after I came home from work. Is there something wrong? I asked, afraid of her answer. Well, she said, we will need to redo one of the bedrooms. Why? I asked. She smiled. Because she said, you are going to become a dad. I jumped for joy and hugged her, covering her face with kisses. Are you happy? She asked. I am the happiest man in the world, I said. Then take me upstairs and show me how happy you are, big guy, she said. I did it again and again. Yes, I thought. Sometimes life gives you lemons, and sometimes you get something much better in return. The husband filmed a video of his wife cheating on him and also a conversation between her and her lover about how they can fool their husband. He sent this video to his lawyer and he began to prepare a divorce. Their prenuptial agreement stated that the cheating party received nothing. Her parents, sister, friends and colleagues at work also received the video. Not a single person took her side. They got divorced. He began dating his ex-wife, and they soon got married. The ex-wife's lover beat her badly. Her father raised his connections, and a week later a message came that he had been severely beaten. 4-5. Cruel treason with insidious plans turned against the culprits. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18... Don't even think about listening to the next one.